Thank you for joining us today. Mr. Nascimento, the senior government classes here at Jenkintown have prepared a series of questions for you to answer. These questions will cover everything from inflation to January 6th. We believe these questions highlight some of the concerns that voters in the 4th District have. We look forward to hearing your responses. At this point, feel free to make a brief opening statement. Thank you. Thank you. So first, thanks for having me. I appreciate you guys taking time out of your, your school day for this. Um, as your principal said, it's critically important for, for each and every one of you to be involved in the political process. No matter which side of the, uh, the political divide you fall on, the most important thing is involvement. And the most important thing that you can do is be involved and be knowledgeable about your candidates and vote for who you think best represents you and what you believe. So I'll just give a brief introduction of myself and uh, who I am and why I decided to do this. My name is Christian Nascimento, candidate for the 4th Congressional District, which is most of Montgomery County and a uh, portion of Berks County. Uh, I'm born and raised in Montgomery County. My father came to this country in 1954, immigrated from Italy, uh, and landed in Narstown and learned to speak English um, in the, the public schools and Catholic schools in Montgomery County. And 20, I always tell people 20 years later I was born. Um, and like I said, born in Montgomery County, raised here, graduated from Plymouth White Marsh High School, uh, and went on to, to go to college, got degrees from Widener University and Villanova University, and embarked in a career in business. Um, first for the first few years in, in corporate finance, and then through the last 20 years or so uh, in, in technology, deploying technology products and broadband uh, at, in both startups and Fortune 30 companies. Also had the, uh, the opportunity to serve on the board of directors of a, um, a private startup um, technology company. And at the same time, I always believed that uh, because this country had given so much to my father, his family, and to my family, uh, that I always owed um, service back to the, to the community. And so, for as long as I can remember, I've been involved in the community, um, kind of culminating in my service on the Facton School Board. I um, served two terms on the school board in Facton, uh, which is where my family and I reside, uh, the last two years of which I served as school board president. So I got to see how government, particularly local governments, but all, uh, all forms of government impact the lives of, of individuals. Uh, my wife and I live in Audubon, and we have four children, um, two of which are your ages, 14 and 16. Um, those are two boys. I have another boy that's 11, and uh, our little girl is eight years old. So it's a busy, loud house, as you can, as you can imagine. And so the reason I decided to run um, for Congress was, one, if I was ever going to run for a public office, it was going to be this district, because this is the area that I grew up. This is the area that, that made me who I am, and this is where I feel most comfortable and where I feel the biggest, um, I'd have the biggest impact because of my roots here. And secondly, you run for office because you feel compelled based on you know, what's happening in the environment around you. And I felt that my experience in business, my experience on the school board, throughout all the things I did, would give me a perspective into some of the, the, the issues that we're facing today, you know, particularly the economy, but other issues that we're facing, global supply chain, foreign affairs, and and so um, I had conversations with my family, long conversations about what this would mean for us. Uh, this isn't something you do lightly. It's actually it's a, it's a massive time commitment. We have been at this since August of 2021, and we have exactly two weeks left. The election is two weeks from today. And so I would just tell you that it's a lot of hard work, but it's been the honor of a lifetime to go around Montgomery and Berks County and meet voters and talk about not just about what I would want to do, but really the conversation is about what do they think needs to be done. Because the news will tell you how divided we are as people, as a country, as a community. What I would tell you is that our foundation, we're closer than people think. And that we all have the same wants and desires. We all want um, an area that's, that's equitable, that's respectful, that's, that has opportunities for all of us. And so on major issues, we are much closer together than we are apart. Um, <laughs> that just doesn't always sell newspapers or, or get TV ratings. And so it's been an amazing honor for me to get around and talk to people of all ages, backgrounds, um, and, uh, and beliefs. And so we're going to spend the next two weeks doing that. And if we're lucky enough to, to get elected to serve, you know, we're going to serve the people of Montgomery and Berks County with honor and with uh, integrity. And so. Uh, that's a little bit about me, and happy to answer any questions that you all have. Thank you. According to the Washington Post's most recent University of Massachusetts at Amherst poll, only 21% of Republicans say Joe Biden's victory 
is legitimate. A big focus of your campaign is on cyber security and election security. How do you plan to reassure the public of the legislation of the legislature and democracy, democratic elections? Do you believe President Joe Biden's victory was legitimate? I do. I've been on record multiple times saying that I believe uh, Joe Biden is the president of the United States. Um, because I turn on TV and I see him every day in the White House, and so you know, you kind of have to believe what you see. Um, so I'm not one that's denied the legitimacy of the, the legitimacy of the 2020 election. Now I will tell you, as someone that's been involved in local politics and, and um, state politics and a lot of politics over the years, there are certainly things that we need to do better in our election process. And if you talk to anybody, this is more of a state issue, but if you talk to anybody involved in state politics, there's a bill that was passed called Act 77, which, um, which allows uh, no excuse mail-in voting. And on its, uh, on its head, you can agree with that or disagree with that, but it's fine, it's a fine bill. Bipartisan support, actually. Republicans and Democrats overwhelmingly voted to have it. The issue that I've seen, you know, from an election integrity standpoint locally is that each county is applying that, that law differently. And so I think that you have some counties where there's more trust in what's happened and some where there's less. Regardless, you know, I'm not someone that denies the legitimacy of the election. You know, I believe that Joe Biden is the president. Um, my personal belief is that he's not doing the job we need him to do, and that's why I'm running, because I think that our government works best when there's checks and balances. And I want to go and be an independent voice for this district and be a check on some of what I think the administration is doing wrong. Um, but that's kind of where I stand on, on, on 2020. Now, the other point of your question is I have been really focused on cybersecurity and, um, and the internet because a lot of that's my background, as I mentioned. Um, and I think this is an area where we are woefully unprepared. Uh, I think that if you look back in the news over the past few years, there's all kinds of reports about cyber crimes, cyber attacks in both the public and private sector. We've seen local governments held hostage with ransomware. We have seen um, We've seen a company like Target get hacked through an a internet an IP connected thermostat. Uh, bad actors were able to get into that connection and wreck havoc with uh, some of their, their payment systems and credit card information systems. Uh, and we've seen a, a country, North Korea, hack a, a movie studio because they didn't like how Seth Rogen was making fun of their, their leader. So all this is to say that we are in a vulnerable place when it comes to cybersecurity. Think for a second, and every day, and what you do, and what you interact with, how much of the, those devices that you touch are connected to the internet? In fact, the better question is, how many of those devices you touch are not connected to the internet? We, you now have smart, I mean, we have smart TVs, right? Now we have smart refrigerators, we have smart appliances. All those devices are connected to the internet, and anything that's connected to the internet can have vulnerabilities. And so, a big passion of mine is making sure that this country and all the people and corporations and everything in it is um, is protected from cybersecurity because this is the easiest way for a bad actor, whether it's a, a, a organization, whether it's a country, anyone who wants to do the United States harm or even just wants to profit off the United States, this is the easiest way for them to do that because all they have to do is be right like one time and they can make thousands and thousands of, of attempts and one wrong attempt could be devastating. There's a nuclear power plant just a few miles from us. Uh, that entire thing is connected to the internet. Just imagine if, if a North Korea or, or another country that wants to do us harm was able to hack into that. All they have to do is turn it down, turn it off, right? And we would have an energy crisis. Um, but they can do things that are much worse than that. So it's a big passion of mine. I feel like this is an issue that I understand that a lot of our elected officials don't understand because they haven't been in this industry like I have. Uh, and it, it directly impacts uh, election integrity, to bring your question fully back, because a lot of the voting machines that are used across the country you have internet connections. And if someone has a, something has an internet connection, it can be hacked into. And so we need to not only make those devices secure, we need to make sure that our, our entire digital infrastructure is secure so that we're protected against organizations or countries that want to do us harm. Thank you. A study by Monmouth University shows that 61% of Republicans now call the events on January 6th a legitimate protest, up from 47% just a year prior. What is your stance on what occurred on January 6th? Was it a riot, a protest, an insurrection, or something else entirely? So I would say it's a tragedy. Um, you know, the, we're talking about the People's House, which is where the people are going to do business, not looking for the good of Uh 
And so I think that what happened on January 6th was a tragedy, and anybody that was involved should be held accountable.
some of the issues we're seeing now is that we don't have enough labor to go do jobs. For example, school districts um, potentially get grants from the state because they have federal funds to go replace HVAC systems. But there's not enough um, firms out there to do that work. And so that gets pushed out. And so that, that increased spending is going to go to uh, lead out for a number of years. At the same time, the way that the Fed, the Federal Reserve uh, Bank, typically addresses inflation is it by driving interest rates up. And we've had historic, historically low interest rates for years now. And what the, the Fed is doing is driving those rates up to try and curtail spending. The problem is that pushes you into uh, more dangerous economic territory. And what that means is that it becomes harder to buy a house, buy a car, even, um, even your credit card interest rates go up. And so I think that what we have to do is get some bipartisan consensus around the amount of spending that we're doing um, and, and pull some of that back, you know, reduce some of the regulations. And I think one of the big drivers of inflation right now is energy prices. And I think we have to, uh, we have to increase domestic production of, of energy. Now we have to do that in a smart way because we know fossil fuels create pollution. Uh, and so we can find a long-term strategy to get to cleaner fuels, which we owe it to, to your generation and the generation that comes after you. Uh, but we have to go and, and increase our energy production in this country now because that will help reduce um, energy costs. And with winter coming, that's an area that we really need really fun. Thank you. President Biden recently issued an executive order that would relieve as much as $20,000 of student debt for low to middle income borrowers. Do you support this action? What measures would you take to help the millions of citizens facing college debt? My biggest issue with um, President Biden's action on this front is that it doesn't get to the heart of the issue. And this is a very important issue for each and every one of you. The heart of the issue is college and university costs are out of control. And I sit on the board of trustees of a college, and I tell you that colleges are talking about increasing their tuitions you know, by several percentage points, and they do that each year. Uh, part of the issue is that colleges and universities, um, they understand that that money is guaranteed because it's incredibly easy for you to get a student loan if it's backed by the federal government. If, the, if you default on that loan, that college and university still gets, the, uh, still gets their revenue. So I think the better issue is, um, is to drive down college and university costs. How do you do that? There's a number of different things that are being experimented right now. There's a, there's a university you've probably all heard of called Purdue out in Indiana. Um, they're exper experimenting with a program where you pay nothing for tuition up front. You get your four-year degree, you go get a job, and then over, I think, the next 10 years, you pay back you know, the, the, the cost of that tuition. Think about that for a second. Imagine going to college and being able to study, study the, course that you, the courses that you want to study with a focus on a, a career that you want to start, and not having to be burdened with the cost of that until you're actually generating the revenue off of the asset that you're getting, which is your college diploma. Right? That's a really innovative, um, that's a really innovative policy that, that eliminates student debt from in that situation whatsoever. Um, I think there's also things that we can do. First of all, we have to hold some of these universities. Some, some of us were talking about um, Harvard. Or I think you got someone over there that's going to be heading to Harvard soon. Um, but Harvard's got a multi-billion dollar endowment, right? Like they need to start using that to do more grants to, and it's not just Harvard, right? Even, even the, the university that I have served with board of trustees has a several over a hundred million dollar endowment. And that's a small Division three university, right? These universities, if you don't need a rainy day fund of hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, these universities need to start using that money to bring tuition down. Um, we need to start you know, holding them accountable to the degrees that they're producing. And my view has always been, you know, I studied accounting, right? That's a professional degree. If somebody else studies art history, which is more of a, a social science degree, why do they both cost the same? You know, statistically, I would make more as an accountant than somebody would as a, as a, a graduate with art, right? Why is that not accounted for in the, in the tuition? So I think my biggest criticism with, um, with the student loan uh, initiative is that it doesn't impact the core problem, which is university costs are spiraling out of control and it will be even worse when each and every one of you uh, graduates and will continue to get worse. So I think we need to do things that, that attack that issue. I also think we need to do things that, um, that will, uh, will make students recognize there's other alternatives, trade schools, tech schools, other things that they can do so we're not pushing every, we should, 
every student that wants to go to college should have that opportunity. We should make sure that folks feel like they have to and get to a situation where they can take a ton of debt, they don't end up getting a degree, and they're stuck with, um, with, with paying that debt. So this is the most controversial, complicated issue that we face today, because on both sides of the aisle, it's viewed as rights, right? Um, one side views it more of a women's right issue, one side views it more as the rights of, a, of the unborn child. And so what we have to do in this scenario is we have to have dialogue, we have to talk about this, right? I've been involved in politics a long time, and I don't see a lot of talking about this. I see a lot of screaming about this. Right, and this goes back to when I was your age, um, and we used to watch. I used to watch news reports of, uh, of abortion providers being involved. Right, I think this is a this is a tough issue, and this is the type of issue where we all need to come together. There's there was some polling that I saw, or survey that I saw of Pennsylvania, and these these percentages aren't aren't 100 percent right, so forgive me. But essentially, a third of people wanted a complete ban on abortion. A third of people wanted no restriction on abortion. And about a third of people wanted abortion, available abortion with restrictions, right? And there was probably about 10% that just didn't, didn't know. Uh, so when you have an issue like that, pushing one thing or the other is going to alienate a certain percentage, and that's not how we, we come together. We have always been at our best when we've come together to solve issues. This is a complicated issue we can solve. My personal opinion is pushing this decision to the states gives more people the opportunity to be involved in this dialogue, and I think any time we have more people involved in a dialogue, that's better. Uh, but I think we need to look at, um, I think we need to, to, to see both sides. I think we not, need to not judge either side. We need to have a dialogue, and I think that dialogue should involve hearing from uh, medical personnel, from scientists, from eth ethics uh, experts, I think we need to have these big hearings and discussions so that we can kind of come, we can come to some kind of compromise that we can all, that we can all coalesce around. Um, when it comes to a national abortion ban, I believe that it should be best decided by the states. I have to say that I wouldn't support a national abortion ban because I believe it would be best decided by the states. I think the one exception to that would be, I think one thing that we should all be able to, to agree on is um, we ought not to have late-term abortions because technology has proven that that life is viable, and I think that's an area where we should try and get consensus on first. But the flip side is, you know, having a complete ban that would say there's no abortion allowed in the case of, for example, the life of a mother is just not realistic, and we should we shouldn't even do that. Nor should we try and hold people legally accountable for for practicing something that's that's legal in states. And so. It's a complicated issue. It's one that I'm willing to, to work across the aisle and with a large amount of people to try and find something that, that the, the country can best put less around. Many cities across the United States are seeing rising rates of homicide and other violent crimes. What steps can the federal government take to help cities and counties reduce crime? So this really is more of a local issue, right? Um, but we're at the point now where we, we're seeing unprecedented amounts of, of crime, particularly murder. I mean, we are here just a few miles away from the city of Philadelphia, um, and we're seeing you know, record murders year after year. My view is that we, we can't have an economy that works for everybody. We can't have a country that works for everybody. We don't have safe streets that work for everybody. And so I think from a federal government standpoint, um, there are some things that we can do around funding to local municipalities. Um, the biggest thing I think that the federal government can do is, and this is on the elected officials, they can dial back the rhetoric. I think when we talk about, um, when we talk about defunding the police, I think all that does is put uh, the people that are elite, that are most vulnerable at risk, because those are the communities that are, that are uh, disproportionately suffering um, gun violence and, and crime. Uh, this is another issue where we've got to be able to come together 
and and hold criminals accountable. Now we shouldn't we shouldn't come to a, we should be at a point where if somebody has a minor offense, you know, they ruin their life. People make mistakes. We have to recognize that. But the crime that we're seeing today is, is really unprecedented, and it's it's destroying families. We saw, we saw just a few miles from here uh, a young man was murdered in Roxburgh. Right? This this must hit home for everybody. It hit home for me for two reasons. One, you know, as I said, I have teenage sons. Two, it happened literally five miles from where I went to high school. And so I spent a lot of time in that area, and I always felt in the city. And it doesn't feel like the city, right? You're, you're around Roxborough High School, it feels very much like Jenkintown, very much like Sheltonham, it feels very much like the suburb. Uh, so there's no wall between Philadelphia and Montgomery County, and so this is an issue that affects all of us. Um, so I think from a federal standpoint, you know, 30 years ago when there was a crime bill, I think that um, there are things that we can take from that, we can learn from that, things that we shouldn't have done, and things that we should do. But I think more funding um, for local municipalities, not, and that's not just to put more police officers on the street, it's to make sure that they're, they're the right types of police officers and that they're trained, not just to arrest somebody, but also how to deal with conflict and how to deal with, um, and how to deal with types of incidents they might run into. It's making sure that the police are supported by other infrastructure um, that, can, that can help the community, right? The best thing you can do about crime is, is not arrest somebody, it's preventative measures, right? Let's give people hope, right? People start to, people, if you murder somebody, it's because you, you've lost hope, right? Or you don't care about life. Let's get back to a point where people have opportunities. You know, my, like I said, my father came to this country, got a job, a union job, and we were able to lift us into the middle class. Let's bring these types of, of industries back so we can give people in the city hope that there's a better future. They don't have to resort to stealing catalytic converters from cars, or they don't have to uh, pull a gun out when there's a, when there's a fight. The other thing that we need to do is we need to hold our prosecutors accountable. Um, what's happening right now in Philadelphia is that criminals are not being prosecuted. And you can hear the police commissioner there, you can hear her talk about it. Um, it it's, not, it, it's not sustainable. And I think we need to make sure that, you know, as, as, a rep, as your representative, I would hold all elected officials accountable. I would speak out uh, against you know, a prosecutor in Philadelphia that wasn't prosecuting. Just like I would speak out against a police officer that wasn't doing their job properly, who was abusing that position. I think that's the first thing we need to do, is we need to speak out on these things. Secondly, you know, if we're going to spend this type of federal funds, this type of federal money, let's funnel some of this to where it can really make an impact, which is in our communities, particularly in our city communities, where we can stop some of this crime. And it's not just police, right? More security cameras. Again, I, I mentioned the economy, more jobs more opportunities, police, athletic centers, things like that, where we can give people opportunities. When I, uh, one of the things that I did at work at Comcast when we were uh, going through the pandemic is I helped design and launch what we call live centers, right? So we took community centers and we fitted them with uh, bleeding edge technology so they were Wi-Fi centers so, people could, so kids could go and do homework while schools were closed. Um, we could do things like that. We can have, we can build public-private partnerships that can, that can occupy kids and, and give kids, get kids the opportunity to be mentored and to be, uh, to be taught things. Um, but it's an issue we've got we've to address because you know, it is bleeding into the suburbs, it's affecting all of us, um, and it's something that I think is, it, it, it's got the potential to really do damage to the fabric of our country. Um, this is a follow-up to the last question. Um, you talk about funding the police better and uh, increasing surveillance. Uh, you know, reform to the prosecution, but do you approve of stricter gun regulations to combat this gun violence that what happened in Roxborough? Yeah, so I think, I think there's a couple things. Um, I think there are gun control measures that we have in place that we need to enforce better. Um, I am not concerned about background checks because, you know, I think that if you have nothing to hide, there's nothing wrong with going through a background check. And technology has made it possible to do those background checks almost instantaneously. Now we shouldn't we shouldn't believe that that's going to solve every issue, right? We've seen certain, many issues where we've um, we've had background checks that just haven't haven't caught something. We're never going to catch everything 100, percent but what we've got to do is we've got to be tighter around the background checks we have. We've got to close background check loopholes so that um, somebody can somebody can can go to a gun show and still get a background check and not take a gun home. What we really have to do is crack down on ghost guns, um, all these um, these guns that can be bought, partially assembled, put together, 
and we need to crack down on illegal guns because the majority of, of crimes that are happening in our area are not happening by people that own guns legally. They're happening by guns that are coming in, whether it's over the border, whether it's being assembled somewhere else, they're coming in. Um, so we can do police buyback uh, or city buybacks, um, but we can tighten gun the whole, uh, gun, uh, background check loopholes and things like that, which can, which can make the, uh, the, the rules and the legislation we have in place even stronger and, and address some of these issues. It's becoming clear that climate change is here and the impact of it can be seen all over the world. Many advocates for the change to cleaner energy as soon as possible. In your interviews, you expressed the, the need for clean for energy independent country. To, to kickstart this suggestion, using fossil fuels in our country for short term wild planning for long term cleaner energy. When would you want these cleaner energies to be implemented into our country? What energy source do you support for a cleaner and more sustainable country? So I support any and all uh, forms of cleaner energy. Um, I am not somebody that says we shouldn't have solar, we shouldn't have nuclear, we shouldn't have natural gas. My view is our infrastructure right now is built off of fossil fuels. We have to, one, find uh, alternative fuels that we can broadly deploy, and then two, we have to build that infrastructure out. Then the third piece is that we can transition that to that infrastructure. What, what I, my criticism of what I see happening sometimes is that we're trying to skip sec, uh, you know, step one or step two and get right to step three. The problem with that is that it impacts the people that can least afford it. You know, when I hear a politician say, well, just go buy an electric car, you know, the last I checked it, they were pretty expensive. Um, and by the way, those electric cars are charged by electricity, which is powered by fossil fuels in a lot of cases. And so I think that we've proven that we can be safer and cleaner with nuclear. Um, and we should look into that as, a, as another alternative. I also think there is, um, you know, re, you know, spent nuclear waste that we could that we could reprocess and use other ways. But the thing is, there are lots of people, lots of really, really smart people uh, all over the country in Silicon Valley and in Austin that are working on technology every day. And I'm not sure they're working on the right technology. Uh, I think I see a lot of people talk about how they're building and testing self-driving cars. My father drove a train for 36 years, right? A self-driving car or self-driving train would put him out of work. Uh, so I'm not sure that we need to be putting truck drivers and taxi drivers out of work. Why not have those smart people working on alternative fuels, right? Alternative energies. Why not harness all the brain power that we have in this country and all the, the innovation and entrepreneurship towards solving those problems, right? Too much of what Silicon Valley and other areas do solves problems that can make them money. I'm all about, I'm all for people making money, but why can't we encourage them to solve problems that not just makes them money, but also uh, makes the world a better place? There was a, a, um, a Democrat running for, con for, for presidency a few years ago, Martin O'Malley, who had a great line and said, you know, alternative energy is the greatest business opportunity the United States ever had. And he's 100% right, we could, we could run the table globally on alternative energy if we invested in the right way. One of the things I've talked about is increased R&D, research and development tax credits. If businesses are going after these types of issues, if they're working on technology that solves these types of problems, we ought to give them tax incentives, tax credits. We ought to make sure they're able to get funding to go to solve that um, so we can encourage more entrepreneurs to go after that. Um, my, my timeline is as soon as possible in a way that's going to be creative to the conversation, which means it's not going to drive gas prices and heating oil prices up in the short term for people that can least afford it, uh, but gets us to a path that leaves a planet that's sustainable for you and your children and your grandchildren. Uh, actions such as Trump's border yeah. wall policies for undocumented immigrants to achieve legal status and controversial moves such as Governor Ron DeSantis' transportation of 48 Venezuelan migrants have taken center stage in America's immigration policies. The number of people trying to cross America's southern border has skyrocketed to significant highs this year. What is your view on the state of immigration in the United States and what federal immigration policies do you support? So this is an area that's massively important to I think I said at the top of the assembly, um, I'm a first generation American, I'm a son of an immigrant. Right? I would not be here standing in front of you if it wasn't for this country's immigration policies. 
And so I've not only always been grateful for that, but I've always believed that I, you know, I owed service back to the country because of that. And so this is like an area, this is an area that's incredibly important to me. Um, so I think there's a few things here um, to bear with me. One, um, we should have a legal immigration system that is efficient, straightforward, secure, and easy. And so anybody that wants to come to this country and be a part of America ought to be welcomed, and they ought to be able to come in in an efficient way, and we shouldn't have people waiting a year for a visa to, uh, to, to join their husband, which I heard you know, knocking on doors from a resident in, in the fourth congressional district. You know, we can solve those things with technology, right? We can solve, solve background checks, as I said before, we can solve visa processing, all those things we can solve with technology. So fundamentally, as a nation of immigrants, we ought to be welcoming of all immigrants. And, and we ought to actually be recruiting the best and the brightest in all areas from across the globe. Once they come here, I think they need to do what my family did, which is assimilate to, uh, to the United States and assimilate and become Americans. That didn't mean that my family left their heritage behind, and it didn't mean that you know, they didn't strongly identify as, as Italian Americans, um, but they became Americans, and they, you know, they brought those, uh, those values and assimilated. So that's the first piece. Um, and by the way, you know, this would help with some of the population decline we have, around the job market, um, this would help in a number of different ways from an economic standpoint. Put aside even the moral question. So one, we gotta make, we gotta change the conversation around immigration and make sure that we're welcoming to everyone to come, come legally. Two, we have an illegal immigration problem. We have massive amounts of people, as you say, coming, to, coming over the border illegally, right? We've gotta do two things. One, we've gotta make sure that the border's secure. And, I, and listen, I think that in history, the United States has knocked walls down. They haven't built them. And so I never was a fan of building big, massive uh, metal and stone structures. I am a fan of using technology, human resources, all the tools at our disposal to make sure that the border is secure. What does that mean? That means we know who's coming over in either direction, and when and why and how. Why is that important? One, we have to control the flow of immigration into the country because it, it takes a toll on our infrastructure. Two, we don't know who's coming over and why they're coming over. We open ourselves up to, um, to bad things happening, right? We talked about guns coming over illegally. There is a huge problem with fentanyl um, coming over, coming across the border illegally. We've got to make sure the border is secure so we can keep our people safe. Um, and our people mean all the people of the United States of America. Um, and three, we've got to make sure that we understand who's coming over because they're looking for, a, you know, a, a a better life, a job, to join a family, they have to go through the legal immigration process. And we have to understand who's coming over is a true refugee or, or someone that's um, someone that's fleeing, you know, a bad situation. We've got to be able to pro you know, process them. Um, but you know, we need to get control of the border because you know a lot of the crime that we're seeing around guns and fentanyl is coming through that. But we can do there, there is no question we can do this in a way that's humane and that's bipartisan if we're just willing to listen to the other side talk to each other. That's it for our question portion. We invite you for any you know, closing statements to the Jamestown Student Body now. Yeah, I would just say, uh, well first, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, it's nice to be able to talk to kids my kids' age and not have them talk back at me. So, uh, so I appreciate uh, how you guys have uh, been respectful. But, um, yeah, this has been a wonderful experience. I really appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate the questions. Um, I would say that you know, asked some harder questions than some of the news reporters I've dealt with. So it speaks well of, of you all and your uh, and your teachers and your curriculum here. Um, I would say get involved. And whether you support me or you support my opponent or you support my party or my opponent's party, the most important thing you can do is get involved. And don't just follow along because mom's a Republican or dad's a Democrat or, or whatever, right? Understand what your core values are and which party aligns best with them and which candidates align best with them. And by the way, if you're a Republican, you can vote for a Democrat. And if you're a Democrat, you can vote for a Republican, right? Too often we try and put ourselves in boxes and we try and identify ourselves as this or that. Um, we do our best work as a country and as a people when we come together. And so, um, you know, I hope that
that each and every one of you gets involved in some way. And then finally, you know, just wish me luck. We've got two weeks left. Thanks very much.